All right, everybody, welcome back to Contemporary American Literature. This week we will be looking at confessional poetry and beat literature, which are movements in primarily poetry, but in the case of beat literature, also fiction and other genres that exemplify what I call mid-century counterculture. And I'm going to explain this term counterculture uh, a bit later when we do the beat writers, but basically counterculture is anything that sets itself apart from what is seen as a dominant culture in any given period, anything that is somehow resistant to a dominant culture. And we've been looking at a lot of literature throughout the semester that focuses on the theme of the outsider, um, and we're going to be sort of continuing that theme this week. But counterculture um, often is an even more thoroughgoing resistance than the mere evoking of some generalized existential condition of the outsider, such as we see in, uh, in, in some of the literature we've been reading. So we'll, we'll see how that works out. So I want to think about this idea of counterculture in the middle of the 20th century, especially as it leads into the 1960s, because we're heading for, remember, this course is going to go in chronological order, and we're going to go into the 60s and the 70s and the social movements and protest movements and the experimental literature that characterizes that period, which was very dominated by counterculture. And I think we can see in confessional poets and beat writers this emerging sense of a counterculture. In the case of the beat writers, they were writing from often from outside the dominant institutions of society and challenging those institutions. And in the case of the confessional poets who tended to be sort of insiders to those institutions, but then began to write um, very personally and very controversially about the problems they were experiencing. In both cases, you have this idea of countering a dominant culture, which, like I said, has been sort of latent, has been implied in what we've been looking at so far, but, but is going to become much more vivid uh, and much more out in the open as we head into the 1960s. The image on my slide is from a painting by the American painter Jackson Pollock. It's called Convergence from 1952. And Jackson Pollock was a painter who was, I think, very much associated with some of the emerging countercultural movements in the 1950s. He um, departed from the traditional forms of painting much more radically than even the prior generations of modernist experiment uh, experimenters in painting did. So whereas a prior generation of painters uh, such as Picasso would have, you know, distorted figures or figures that were seen from multiple perspectives in one image in Picasso's cubism or in other kinds of abstract painting. For Pollock, he would paint by dripping paint and flinging paint onto the canvas. And so he produced these, what are called drip paintings. He himself called them action paintings because he almost physically attacks the canvas. He would uh, lay it on the floor and then like circle it almost in a dance-like way and fling the paint at the canvas. And his style of art was called abstract expressionism. And it's abstract because it's not a picture of a figure. It's not a picture of a setting or a landscape. It's not a picture of a face. It's abstract in the sense of it's a purely kind of mental image. It's not a picture of anything. And abstract art went back, you know, to modernism, but ab it was usually an abstraction of something. It was an abstract version of a figure or a face or a landscape. Pollock is so abstract that it's, it's purely uh, a, a kind of image in the mind that goes onto the canvas. It has no relation to reality. It's in, in no way an imitation of reality. And then expressionism is a type of art where kind of what it just what it sounds like you express the artist expresses you know their innermost thoughts and feelings and emotions and so Pollock was expressing himself without mediating it through trying to make a picture of anything else it was just the pure contents of his soul sort of disgorged onto the canvas and so Pollock's abstract expressionism I think is very much in line with confessional poetry and with beat literature, which try to 
get around some of the impersonal standards of modernism, which was very impersonal, and of realism, which always was, you know, meant to, you know, be a, you know, well-crafted representation of reality, like we saw in the stories we read last week. Um, this kind of mid-century counterculture, I think, was opposed to both of those things. Dispense with the craft, dispense with trying to represent the mere externals of reality, and just unseal your innermost feelings, your, your sort of the volcanic inner torments that you're going through. Uh, and that is what abstract expressionism, confessional poetry, and beat literature have in common. However, um, to invoke Pollock is to uh, begin to touch on a subject that I mentioned, I think, a few lectures ago, and I said I would get back to. And I, I don't know, there's not really a great natural place to put this in the course, but I think this is the best place to put it. I want to talk a little bit about how some American countercultural energy in art and literature was not wholly grassroots and organic. That is to say, it wasn't something that just welled up to challenge dominant institutions. In some ways, dominant institutions believed they could use some of these countercultural energies for their own purposes. And while what I'm about to say has been known for a long time, has been known for almost 50 years in a lot of ways, I think it's, um, it's only now become something that's really deeply been academically studied and it's something that m even you know most people who aren't in academia are becoming aware of and it's uh, it's becoming something the the enormity of of it and the implications of it are something i think that we've only begun to understand even though it's been known since the the late 60s or early 70s and what i'm talking about is the cultural cold war this was a phenomenon that um, went from the end of World War II and officially came to an end in 1968. And there's a, I, I take my name on the slide, The Cultural Cold War, from a book written on the subject in 1999, which I think was the first book to fully investigate the subject. It was by a British journalist named Francis Stoner Saunders called The Cultural Cold War, The CIA and the World of Arts and Letters. And since Saunders published her book, there's been a number of journalistic and academic studies by historians and cultural critics uh, looking at this phenomenon. Um, there's been more recent work done in the last decade that really looked into how this phenomenon affected literature and the teaching of literature and the teaching of creative writing in colleges and universities. So what was the cultural Cold War? So let's go back to 1946 it's after world war ii the an alliance between the united states and the soviet union has defeated nazi germany and imperial japan however there are natural tensions between the um the allies between the united states and great britain and between between them and the communist world because they um, the, the allies have a largely liberal capitalist system of government and the communist uh, world has a communist system of government which involves a much more direct hand of the state in controlling both the economy and the sort of social institutions like things like the arts and education. Uh, so supposedly, as you'll see, it's, it's not that neat a distinction. So... Uh, so naturally there's a tension, and so what develops is this Cold War, so-called because the United States and the Soviet Union never fought a war, so they never fought a hot war, though the Cold War is, is also a seriously uh, misconceived name because what did happen over the course of uh, this, you know, second half of the 20th century is that the United States and the Soviet Union fought a series of proxy wars in formerly colonized countries in the global south, most notably Vietnam, but also Korea and other places. Um, however, there was also a lot of things happening during the Cold War that were fighting by means that were not military. And one of these things is both countries, uh, both, you know, or, or all countries party to the Cold War, developed very, you know, intense 
intelligence services to spy on the other countries and to to uh, to uh, to intercept spying on their own countries. And one of the things that happened in the United States and Great Britain is that their intelligence agencies, such as the CIA in America and MI6 in Britain, decided that one of the ways they needed to fight communism was to discredit it in the cultural sphere, to make communist culture look unappealing, to make it look um, rigid and dogmatic and doctrinaire and, uh, and generally inferior to the freer cultures of the United States and Great Britain and other Western European countries. So what they did, ironically, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, the irony is really hard to, to fully communicate, to demonstrate that um, artists and thinkers in the United States and Great Britain were free of state interference, the state began to interfere in art and thinking in the United States and Great Britain. So what they did was they began to recruit artists and intellectuals to what they called the non-communist left. And the idea here being that you could be left-wing in a cultural way that is resistant to institutions that dominated society. Um, you could be an experimental artist. You could be um, an artist who challenged established conventions of art. You could be a thinker who challenged, let's say, certain religious traditions or certain... Um, you know, conservative ideas in culture. But as long as you didn't sort of say that, you know, the, the, the economic system should be changed to fully equalize society by the intervention of the state, then you were on the non-communist left. So intelligence agencies like the CIA recruited artists and intellectuals to serve this purpose of being the non-communist left. A, a counterculture, an avant-garde, who would be interestingly challenging to received wisdom and dominant ideas and all sorts of conventions in art and morals and religion, but who wouldn't be communists in the economic or political sense. And they thought if they did this, they would make the West look really appealingly pluralistic and sophisticated. So they promoted things like avant-garde art, uh, and abstract expressionism in particular was something they were interested in promoting. And Jackson Pollock became a celebrity. He was in mainstream magazines. Um, there were documentaries made about him. He became a superstar. Um, and the idea was that his painting was sort of inherently American because it was so individualistic. All it is, all his painting is, it looks really radical and avant-garde, but it's very traditionalistically American because what is the essence of, uh, you know, the traditionalistically American on this view, but hyper-individualism? And what is his painting but the unmediated expression of the individual literally flung onto the canvas? And so in that sense, Nelson Rockefeller, a rich art collector and philanthropist and other things, collected Pollock's art and called it free enterprise painting because Pollock was a kind of entrepreneur in the world of the arts. And they also promoted things like jazz music because one of the um, charges that the Soviet Union often made against the United States was you claim to be for freedom and yet you have these racial uh, hierarchies. You have Jim Crow and segregation. And so the CIA thought there was a need to promote African American art to show, in their view, that there was actually this pluralistic diversity in America. Um, and they promoted political philosophy of a kind of liberal sort. So, uh, so the cultural Cold War, again, just to rephrase, is the Western intelligence agencies, primarily the CIA, sort of intervening in the artistic and intellectual world to promote a version of the political left they could live with, which was one that would be cultural, but not primarily political and economic. And I think that's something you need to understand in understanding some of the ways in which these countercultural elements were only countercultural up to a point. And it's interesting that 
um, the biographies of some of the writers we're going to read this week uh, that are given in the Norton Anthology often come back to the idea. It's said several times in these biographies of like Sylvia Plath and John Barrowman and Allen Ginsberg that while their work looked radical, it was really, you know, very, very much in the American tradition and looks a lot like classic American literature, just in a sort of weirder and more radical form. And I think that that's, <laughs> that, I don't want to sound paranoid, but that's what the CIA was going for. Um, so, so that's something to keep in mind. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying, by the way, that any of the writers that were reading particularly received funding from the CIA or anything like that. It didn't really work that way. The way it worked was the CIA would give money to, let's say, an organization that gave grants to artists and writers. And then that organization would give grants to writers and artists in line with the CIA's mission. So the artists and writers didn't usually know what was going on here. Jackson Pollock wasn't aware that he was working for the CIA. He just thought he was getting a grant from the Ford Foundation or the Rockefeller Foundation. It was the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation that was working with the CIA to effect this. And some critics today even sort of don't have a problem with this. Uh, some critics do and some critics don't. Some critics are like, this was a terrible, secretive, horrible intervention um, and that was Frances Stoner Saunders' position. She thought this was an outrage and a scandal. Uh, but other people were like, well, you know, uh, you know, we, they had to defend uh, liberal democracy and then they promoted some good writers. And wouldn't, wouldn't it be better today if the CIA would give uh, avant-garde writers and artists money is what some people today say. So you have to decide what you think about this. Um, but so that's my point. A variety of publications, exhibitions, events, artists, and institutions were funded via CIA money, which was laundered through various front organizations. And this includes, it was really revealed in the last decade, the Iowa Writers Workshop, which we've mentioned a couple times as the premier institution that gets started to uh, make the Master of Fine Arts degree in creative writing an important part of becoming a writer in the 20th century. Um, a scholar named Eric Bennett wrote an article called How Iowa Flattened Literature, which then became a book, the title of which I don't remember. But the idea, you can read the article online if you want, um, uh, was that uh, the director of the Iowa Writers Workshop probably knowingly received some CIA money to uh, to promote to promote these ideals of sort of free liberal writing and poetry in his writing workshops. And the idea would be that you would write as a form of self-expression and you wouldn't touch political topics. Um, that's a little bit oversimplified, but that's basically the the mentality that got put into the Iowa Writers Workshop. And from there, the general teaching of how to do creative writing at the college and graduate level in the United States. So that's the cultural Cold War. I don't mean to uh, to be paranoid or to, to give you conspiracy theories. This is true and has been investigated by plenty of reputable people. Um, and it was brought to an end in 1968 because there were a variety of reasons it was brought to an end. Some journalists, first of all, exposed it, but also um, when, so this was being done sort of more or less covertly by the CIA, but the, the, the government didn't necessarily like this, particularly President Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he was not of the kind to appreciate avant-garde art. Uh, he thought it was, you know, he would have looked at Jackson Pollock and said it looked like bird droppings or something. And so he uh, wasn't too thrilled with this. He thought it was stupid. Um, and I think he would have liked to have pulled the funding. I think a lot of politicians weren't into this idea if they knew about it. But this was, you know, often this was being done covertly in the... Uh, um, I hope this term hasn't become too contaminated because it's actually a term that does describe something, the deep state. Uh, this is what these kinds of semi-autonomous and clandestine agencies are. They're a kind of um, layer of the state that's doing things without necessarily the, uh, the top democratically elected layer of the state always knowing about it. So it was brought to an end in 1968, officially. I put a question mark there, paranoically, uh, because, you know, um, you know, I assume if, if, if we're really not supposed to know, we won't know. So, uh, but that's the cultural Cold War. I also put this in here 
So you know we're about to read a lot of paranoid literature once we get into the 60s. Writers like Thomas Pynchon and Ishmael Reed, who are very into conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorizing. And I don't, I don't want you to think they're just completely deluded. Uh, they're, they're responding to things that are actually happening in the world around them um, that, uh, that, were, that the government was actually doing. And so paranoia isn't a feature of the literary and intellectual landscape for no reason. So that's the cultural Cold War. Again, it doesn't necessarily directly relate to everything we're going to read this week, but I just thought you should know. Uh, so that's that. So now from there, I want to move on to talking about confessional poetry, what it is, and uh, some examples in the poems of Robert Lowell and Sylvia Plath and John Berryman. Um, so I will do that in the next lecture. Thanks very much and have a great day.